Welcome back to another full card UFC breakdown. I am 138 MMA and I will be your host for the evening on this journey that we depart on. We're going to come from the, from the prelims all the way up through the main event of the card. We're going to cover every single fight in depth, break them down, and I'll give you a pick and prediction as maybe even, you know, talk about some props or things like that along the way. But real quick, before we get into that, you can find me on Twitter and Tapology at 138 MMA because, you know, that's the name, so go figure. Also, to those of you that are already supporting me over on Patreon.com slash 138MMA, I appreciate you to the moon and back. Thank you guys so much. For anybody else, you can join them over there on Patreon.com slash 138MMA. The link's in the description as well. You can find all of the information that you need. My notes, Patreon parlay hit last week. That was a nice one. Um, you can also find uh, my picks with confidence ratings, all sorts of goodies. And, you know, sometimes I'll throw out some extra stuff in there. But you can find all of that on patreon.com slash 138MMA. Now let's go ahead and break down these fights right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world! Here right now, we'll be kicking off the card in the women's bantamweight division, but I'll be honest with you guys, I thought about just not even breaking this one down because this is our third try at a Haley Cowan fight, and I keep breaking these dang things down, and they keep not happening, but I'm I'm hoping this one happens. We've got Jamie Lynn Horth taking on Haley Cowan. Haley Cowan is 4-1 in her last five, 5-0 five oh on the career for Horth. Um, in this one here, we've completely different matchup than all the others. We've got Jamie Lynn Horth, who, decent striking. The kicks seem to be the best thing, um, and she can put together kind of basic combinations, which is good for someone who's 5-0. and oh. Give her some credit. I'm not, like, basic combinations isn't a bad thing at 5-0. and oh. It's you know, not bad. Uh, she's decent grappling. She has good top pressure. But the problem is she's typically a flyweight. She's going against someone in Haley Cowan who has decent striking, but her striking defense is terrible. Uh, but decent wrestling as well. The takedown volume is there, and she has good takedown defense, typically because she's strong and has good balance. Uh, her background as a gymnast probably helps with that. But like I mentioned, strong and athletic. She's also a true bantamweight. In fact, bantamweight, she's, she's muscular for the bantamweight division. I know a lot of people are on the horse side. I'm not. I'm on Haley Cowan's side. I think that Haley Cowan is going to be bigger, stronger. Well, I don't. I don't. I know she's going to be bigger and stronger, but I think she's going to, be able to use that to kind of muscle her way out of some bad positions with Horth, kind of get top position and just grind out rounds. I think she's going to be able to do more damage on top just by being a bigger, stronger fighter and kind of bully her way to a, a decision win here. Because Horth, like I said, typically a flyweight. Yeah, she might have you know a few areas of her game that are a little more polished than Cowan, but. She's not the athlete that Cowan is, and I'm, I'm going to take Cowan. Uh, that's where I'm at, but let me know what you guys think. Also, this card is, gonna, this is wild because I got a little bit crazy on Sunday and uh, probably put way too much action on this card. So, guys, this is going to be a fun card. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm also nervous as all get out. I had some, I had a win last week over, overall, and, uh, you know, got a little crazy on Sunday. So now here we are. We're going to break down this card and we're going to hope for some big winnings. So I'll see you guys in the next one. In the men's band of weight division, we have Brian Kelleher taking on Journey Newsom. Now Journey Newsom won three and one in his last five. That one is a, the extra one that is, is a no contest in which he won, but he was smoking too much weed and failed his test. So now it's a no contest. So it doesn't look too good on the last five, but it's about the same as Kelleher if you just don't care about the weed so much. So Two and three for Kelleher in his last five. Now, for Kelleher, much better level of competition, so take that into account. But the two and three, roughly two and three. We're going to look at this one here. We got boxing on the side of Kelleher. Pretty good boxing. Decent combinations. His grappling is probably probably where he's best, I guess. Um, he's good in the scrambles. He's got a nice guillotine. The thing is, I don't like this, but some people do where he's going to look for submissions from his back rather than try to get back to his feet. I would rather see a guy like this try to get back to his feet and get to that boxing, maybe get on top with his own wrestling, but whatever. Um, he does get taken down quite a bit, um, and he can be held down because he's sitting there looking for submissions and not trying to get back up, so he can lose rounds that way. For Newsom, kind of just decent everywhere. I mean, I give him a good rating as a striker, but he's pretty much just decent everywhere. Um, wrestling, grappling, striking is... I'll say good, because he's pretty good at range, and he does have some nice power for the 135-pound division. Uh, but his fight IQ at times is very questionable. Uh, in this one here, this is a total pass for me, honestly. But to make a pick, I'm going to take Newsom, But mostly just because I can see 
Kelleher not trying to get back to his feet and being on his back and trying to work for submissions that just he doesn't get, and then giving up like two rounds to Newsom and losing 29-28. That's where I'm at, but who knows? This, this, is a, this is a total pass for me, and I went a little crazy on Sunday. So for me to go crazy on Sunday and still not bet on this one, that should be a sign to you guys. Don't bet on this fight. Anyway, next fight. Let's Women's go. Bantamweight division. A lot of Bantamweight fights on this card. We have Irina Alexeva taking on Stephanie Egger. For Egger, I didn't close these parentheses. Look at that. Low budget stuff here on 138 MMA. Uh, three and two for Egger in her last five. Obviously, four and one for Alexeva, as that's her whole career as a pro so far. So, um, you know, let's we'll start with her side. Obviously, we've got a lot less to cover being four and one, but she does have solid judo. Um, nice throws, and she's good in the cage push. That's what she's going to want to do. Push someone up against the cage, hold them there, win some minutes, and then toss them when she gets the opportunity. She does have forward pressure, and she's going to come forward with her striking. She's going to come forward and throw these big looping shots, but they're very powerful. Wide open to be countered. Thankfully for her, though, Stephanie Egger has horrible output and just isn't a striker. So thankfully for us, she's coming in, throwing these big bombs. She's probably not going to get countered and dropped. Maybe she does. Maybe Egger's been working on her striking. I don't think so, though. Um, so, yeah, swinging big bombs. Could she catch Egger? Yep, totally. Could. Uh, could drop her. But Egger's also got solid judo. Nice throws as well. Probably a little bit better. Uh, heavy on top. I do like that. And also, she's going to be seeking that submission once it gets to the mat because as soon as it hits the mat, boom, she's looking for him. She is looking for him. At, at, she's looking to finish early and I guess I would say often, but you, once it's done, once it's it's over. But um, but yeah, she's looking for those finishes early. As soon as she gets the fight to the mat, especially if she can get that toss, get into that either the side control scarf hold somewhere around there, kind of start working from that position. She does very well with that judo background. Now both of them have a judo background, and both of them are pretty credentialed in that area. So I could be wrong, but I think Edgar's better in that area. I think she's going to be the more. Um, she obviously has more MMA experience, like, you know, by quite a big margin. Um, in fact, more than double. Uh, I believe she's going to be able to get this fight to the mat under her terms. And if she does, I think she wins. However, to be cautious, there is the, the chance that uh, Alexeva lands that big shot. She's coming in just winging these big hooks and drops Egger and is able to make short work of her on the ground with the follow-up and striking. So keep that in mind, but I do think Egger gets the submission. And I don't mind a play on the, on the submission prop there for the simple fact now, Edgar's going to be, like, more than a minus 300 favorite, and that's a little bit unplayable at this point, unless you're going to parlay her. And at that point, eh, eh. But I do like the submission prop. Let me know what you guys think. Maybe even a round one submission prop would be worth it. Um, I, th I do think if she does get it done, it's probably going to be round one because homegirl's coming in there hard. She's going to be trying to throw bombs, and she's going to she's going to make them meet. It's not like they're going to stand on the edge and just kind of stare at each other because she's coming forward. She's using that forward pressure and she's throwing those bombs. So I do think that if that Egger probably gets the round one sub, that might be what I play. Now that I just said that, I haven't, I haven't played either of them yet. I don't think the props dropped, but either way, let me know what you guys think. I would love to hear your opinion on this fight specifically, because I'm really interested in it. If you've done any tape study whatsoever, um, yeah, let me know. And I'll see you next time. What is believed to be the welterweight division, although this is a short notice fight, so it could be a catch weight. But as of right now, anything I know, it is the welterweight division. So we're going to stick with that for now. We got Trey Waters coming in short notice to take on Josh Quinlan. Both guys, four wins in their last five. We got a loss for Waters in there. That was to Gabriel Bonfim, so no shame there. Uh, the other one for Quinlan is a no contest. Uh, Quinlan is typically going to be on the sauce, it sounds like. So there's that. Um, but, you know, whatever. Uh, he does happen to be a shorter fighter here. He's six foot with a 72-inch reach, which is normally not short. But he's going up against Waters, who is a tower of a man at 6'5", with a 77-inch reach. One thing I will tell you ahead of time, that this fight should not go the distance. Somebody's probably getting knocked out. So keep that in mind when you are looking at what you should play in this fight. Somebody probably getting knocked out. So Trey Waters, good striking. And for a rangy guy, he does work well in the pocket. Um, he's got good head movement, but his hands are way down here, which makes him need that head movement. So there's that. Um, his knees up the middle are actually super deadly, and because he's a freakishly tall human being, especially in the welterweight division, uh, that knee up the middle is going to catch a lot of guys right in the face with effortless ease, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, he's also a very accurate striker, and that's how he gets a lot of his knockouts. Like, yes, he has power, but uh, the, the accuracy is what does it. But he gets wild at times when he's really pressed. So, like, if somebody's coming in, working him hard, he can start swinging wild shots and do away with the accuracy a bit. Uh, so that is something we can see against a guy like Josh Quinlan. But 
Uh, if it doesn't end up in the grappling department for Trey Waters, he does have decent grappling in his own right. His takedown defense is pretty darn good, and he's going to be starting to work for those submissions with his, his choking arms. He's got those small choking arms, you know what I mean? They slip right under the neck. I've told you about it before. You've heard it. Whatever. Welcome back to the video. <laughs> All right? So here we go. Josh Quinlan, though. Let's fix that. My curtain fell down. Uh, Josh Quinlan is still fall down. Uh, he is a powerful striker. There we go. With a blitzing style. When he comes in, he's going to start throwing big shots. And then he's going to come back out if it didn't work. And he's going to come back in and blitz you again. He does have very heavy leg kicks, though. And for a tall, thinner guy, because you have to be thin to be 6'5 and make 170, those leg kicks, I mean, you'd be kicking those toothpicks real hard. You know, it might break them in half. So heavy leg kicks for the Quinlan side. That is an option. He does have good wrestling and jujitsu. He just doesn't use it super often because he wants to go in there and take people's heads off. Um, but decent wrestling. Takedown defense is not as good, so his wrestling is good offensively, not as much defensively. Um, but he does work to get back up in, if he does end up getting taken down. With his jujitsu, he has really good sweeps. So if you do take him down, instead of getting back up, he can also sweep you, you know, get over on top, take top position, do what he needs to do. But realistically, this is probably a striking matchup. Uh, that's what both guys typically want to do. Both guys' game plans are probably going to be that. I'm going to make a pick because that's what I do. But seriously, this fight's probably not going the distance, and I think somebody's getting knocked out. So either guy to win by knockout, if you're able to play that in one of your books, is probably a good way to go. Um, Trey Waters either knocks him out with a big knee up the middle or catches him as he comes into the pocket and hits him with some nasty stuff. Or Quinlan comes in there swinging big bombs, and, you know, he's probably on the sauce. So coming in there swinging big bombs, throwing big heavy leg kicks, and drops Waters like a sack of potatoes. So for me, I'm going to pick Quinlan. He didn't fight two weeks ago, just like Trey Waters did. This isn't super short notice for him. Yeah, Trey Waters fought like two weeks ago in LFA. Uh, he won that fight, but, you know, whatever. Uh, for Quinlan, had some time to prepare, didn't just fight, and, I mean, it's probably on the sauce, so you got to keep that in mind. I'm going to take Quinlan. Let me know what you guys have. It's a very low-confidence pick here. The knockout, somebody's getting knocked out. That's what I'm. That's the, the bet, all right? So I'll see you in the next fight. A rare fight. occasion where we had a flyweight fight that I don't just absolutely love the under. Uh, have I played it? Not yet. Can I be convinced to do so? We'll see by the time fights happen. So in this one, we have Cody Durden taking on Charles Johnson. Uh, both guys three and two in their last five. There's going to be, going to be a size advantage on the Johnson side. He is fine <laughs> with a 70 inch reach, five, seven and a 67 inch reach for Durden. Just ignore that. Um, anyway, in this matchup here for Johnson, uh, he needs to quit fighting so dang much because my notes are starting to get off the darn board with him. Uh, cause I don't know if you guys know this when I'm watching fights, I'm sitting there with my notebook, like notebook. Um, I write down all the notes on the fighter, whatever. While I'm watching these fights, I'm chatting these things down, getting my information. Uh, sometimes when I'm hanging out with friends and watching them at like, um, you know, at, at, you know, like a big group event, I don't jot down the notes. I'll come back and watch them later and, you know, re-watch them so I can watch for notes rather than just for fun. But typically I'm taking notes when I'm watching fights. Johnson fights all the damn time, so we got a lot of notes. Let's put it that way. So anyway, in this one here, we've got a fast starter in Durden and a slow starter in Johnson. So uh, for Cody Durden, we're going to start with him because he's the faster starter. It makes sense. We'll start with him. He does have solid wrestling. Basically, the takedowns and the volume of takedowns are just going to be what wins him a lot of fights. He's just coming forward, shooting takedowns, continuing to shoot takedowns as you're getting back up. Doesn't matter. Just keeps going. He has struggled to hold guys down in the past, but the volume of takedowns can usually wear guys out. And he does land decent ground and pound while he's doing it. His striking is just decent, but he does have power. And it's a lot of times set up by that, that you know, shot of the takedown and then the big overhand because it's something wrestlers like to do. Um... But yeah, the power's there. Uh, it, I mean, he's a flyweight, so it's not like, you know, it's not like he's knocking out trucks, but he does have good power. Uh, also, he's very high motor and he's durable. So he can take a shot and uh, that, that high motor just keeps him going until he runs out of gas, basically. So I do think Cody Durden is going to be probably winning the first round. Uh, when we look over at Charles Johnson, he's a slower starter. So typically he doesn't win the first round. He can, but he doesn't typically. He has solid Muay Thai. Those body kicks are absolutely deadly. Works in combination, strikes to all levels, legs, body, head, does not matter, and he can mix his punches and kicks together in combination, which is phenomenal. He is by far the better striker in this matchup. He has good gra grappling as well. Works submissions and ground and pound. When he's on top, obviously, he's using more ground and pound off his back. It's not like a super good option, but he does mix in submissions and ground and pound, and he uses them to set each other up. If he's looking for a submission and you're going to try to, you know, resist the submission, well, guess what? You're 
getting ground and pounded. He starts laying the ground and pound and you're starting to block. Well, guess what? You're going for the submission. I love it when fighters do that. That's why I point it out every time I see it in a fighter. I do like that about Charles Johnson. He does have good wrestling. Um, his takedown defense is so-so. It's not terrible, but it's so-so. But he's very hard to hold down. He's good in the scrambles. He's good at just kind of working his way out. Shrimps, gets his hips out, tries to work his way back up. Do you guys know what shrimping is? Are, uh, basically, it's where you, you look like a shrimp when you like push your hips out from when you're trying to get from out from under somebody. Uh, those of you that do jiu-jitsu, you know what, a sh what shrimping is. But I just said that, and I wasn't sure how many of you do. So anyway, shrimps out. Tries to start working back, get his you know feet on the hips and push, whatever. Uh, but he's got very good cardio, and I think a lot of that is because he just paces himself properly rather than just coming out like a you know like a head of steam like Durden's gonna do. So I think if this gets to the third round, Johnson's probably gonna win the third round. So what does that mean? We got a first round for Durden most likely, and we got the third round for Johnson most likely. The second round is what's gonna be in question. Either guy could win that. That is a toss up. So when it comes to picking this fight, who do I think is gonna win? Uh, well. As crazy as it is, I think all this finishing upside is probably going to be Durden because I don't, unless Johnson finishes him in the third round due to exhaustion, but I don't think that he will. Durden's a pretty tough dude. He's pretty durable. So the finishing upside is on the Durden side and the round one is on Durden's side. Round three is on Johnson's side. We have to make it to round three for the Johnson to necessarily win round three. Round two, Johnson could win round two. But Durden could also finish Johnson in round two. I'm going to slightly, the slightest bit lean Durden because I think he has better finishing upside. And I don't think that the skill, the, the better skills in the striking is going to be so much so that he's going to be able to make up for, you know, the rinse and repeat takedowns of Durden. And at some point in there, I could see Durden landing some heavy shots, doing enough damage that he's able to continue that through the second round and probably lose the third round. Um, almost certainly lose the third round because Johnson's going to have that cardio left and Durden being a guy that comes out, you know, hotter than a tea kettle, he's going to come out there high motor, ready to roll. He's probably going to gas out by the third or not like total death gas type of thing, but like, you know, he's going to be pretty worn out by the third. So I'm going to take Durden, but slightly, I haven't bet it. And typically Durden's been a cash cow for me, guys. I, my biggest bet of 2022 last year was Cody Durden to win inside the distance against JP Bays. And a lot of people were picking Bays. Go back and watch their videos. They were picking Bays. Don't let them tell you any different. I was saying, Durden's going to get this done inside the distance. And he beat the brakes off that guy. Now, JP Bays isn't that good. But I kind of feel, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm liking the Durden side because, you know, some of that. I bet him in his last matchup. He got the win there. He's always an underdog. He's 3-2 and two in his last five. I bet him in most of those fights. Uh... I did, regrettably, I bet him in the Makaya fight. I thought Makaya was going to be a total fraud. Well, I got that one wrong. But I didn't bet him in his other loss, whoever that was. I can't remember. But I bet him four out of five times in his last, and he's been pretty darn good to me. So, Cody Durden's a pick. I went on a rant there. Whatever. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in Tom Levy taking on Pete Rodriguez as he makes his lightweight debut. Uh, Rodriguez is four and one in his last five. Same over on the Levy side. And I know there's a lot more on one side than the other here, but let's be honest, Pete Rodriguez's fights are typically pretty short, so we don't have a ton to go off of here. So we'll break him down first. He's a powerful striker willing to eat one to give one. He seems to be durable because he can eat one to give one. And he's a very fast starter. He's going to come across the cage. He's going to try and knock your ass out. And if he does, great. If he doesn't, well, we don't know yet. So, um, I mean, obviously he's lost one, but whatever. Nathan Levy, on the other hand, dude's got good striking. Uh, karate style kicks. I like those for keeping range. And I think he's going to be able to keep range against Rodriguez here. Uh, he does have nice straight shots. His hooks leave a lot to be desired, but his straight shots are very good. Um, the counters are there. They're available for him, even when he uses a hook. But he is good at countering. He's good at timing it. He doesn't have a ton of power, though. Uh, in the grappling department, which is weird because he has a karate background, but I think he's a better grappler than he is a striker. Solid grappling with a large toolbox. He's quick to jump on transitions. As they open up, he's going to jump right on that transition, snatch something up, and try to look for a submission. Um, and he has good wrestling as well, so we can help get it to the mat. His single leg takedown is particularly his best takedown. In this matchup, Matong Levy should win. But first round knockout prop for Rodriguez is very tempting. I might play that as a counter to Natan Levy being in some parlays. And then, you know, it's a win-win. I sometimes catch some flack for playing both sides. But guys, I'm in the business of making money here. I'm trying not to. I'm, I, playing both sides guarantees you money. I'm not here to say, oh, yeah, my picks are 100%. I'm here to say I'm trying to make money, guys. Yeah, I'm making picks for the show. You can check out my picking percentage on Tapology. 
We trying to make money, guys. I got to eat groceries. You know how expensive groceries are right now? I got to make me some cash. So I'm probably going to play both sides, to be honest. Pete Rodriguez, first round knockout. Natan Levy is probably safe for most parlays. So Natan Levy's the pick. If he gets knocked out in the first round, hey, I told you to play both sides. Let me know what you guys think. I'll right, see you in the next We're down at heavyweight here. Uh, we're up at heavyweight here. We have Jake Collier coming in two and three in his last five. Five and oh on the Martin Boudet side. This matchup here is interesting because we've got Jake Collier, who's pretty good everywhere, uh, but he's former middleweight, fighting up at heavyweight just because he's kind of fat. So that's a problem. Uh, for Martin Boudet, hasn't really been tested against some of the better guys yet, but doing all right on his last five. So I, this is a tough one to pick. I'm going to break it down for you. For Martin Boudet, the dude is a powerful striker, and you can get it done with that. Um, he's a good grappler, kind of just a grinder. Um, his cage push is where he can rack up the most amount of time, get you up against the cage, just control you there, and just kind of pepper you with the dirty boxing, um, hit you with some stuff. But he's really low output at time. Most of the time, he's low output. Uh, so good minute winner by just kind of controlling, uh, but he does have that big knockout potential. Now for Collier, he's a good striker with movement and leg kicks, but the problem is he's way undersized. So he's not really knocking anybody out at this point, but also like, you know, he, he's probably going to be quicker than most heavyweights. But the problem is he's also kind of fat. So it just happens. You know, fat heavyweights aren't usually the most mobile. But he is pretty mobile. So we'll give him that. Um, he's a decent grappler. He does just stay active, whether he's on top or bottom. He's just trying to do something throughout. I think Budai should be able to win a really boring decision here. I kind of like the over. Uh, but I'm not going to play a side because who knows. Uh, but I don't think Collier's been the same ever since he lost to um, Arlovsky because he really believed he won that fight. And, I mean, a lot of people did. Um, I was on the Arlovsky side, but, like, even watching it, I was kind of like, yeah, I think Collier might have won that. But I took the win. It was a small bet, but I took the win because, you know, usually you just bet Arlovsky by decision and you take your money, right? But either way, ever since that fight, Collier's just kind of been – not the same Collier. He was pissed off in the, the post-fight interview. Next fight didn't look at all the same. So I'm going to take Budai. No confidence in that, but I do kind of like the over. I do. There is the upside of, of Budai to get the knockout. It's totally possible. But I think Collier's tough enough that he's going to be able to hang in there for the over or whatever the heck it is. One and a half, two. And, if you can get over one and a half, play that. It's probably fine. Over two and a half might be a little sweaty, but I think it's probably going to decision for Budai. But you never know. Anyway, not confident. I haven't bet this fight at all, honestly. I might not even bet the over. Let me know what you guys think. Do you like the over? Do you like the under? Do you like somebody in this fight? I don't know. I want to hear your opinion. Another Let's heavyweight see matchup that I'm just not too gosh darn sure about. We have Waldo Cortez Acosta coming in 5-0 in his last five fights, but a much lower level of competition than a guy like Marcos Rogerio de Lima, who is 3-2 and in his last five. Uh, yeah, this is basically just kind of how's it? How is Acosta going to handle the step up? So, Cortez Acosta, he is the taller, longer fighter, six foot four inches with a 78 inch reach, as opposed to six one seventy five inch reach, and that is going to play into Acosta's advantage because the dude is a boxer with good boxing and a very solid rangy jab. When he throws that jab out there, he gets his shoulder turned all the way to maximize the range of that jab, which is something I really do like from Acosta. There's a lot of things I don't like, but that is one thing I do like. Uh, he has a pretty decent volume, especially with the jab. He can throw in combinations. Typically, it's the one-two, but he can throw in combinations even if it's just a two-puncher. Um, and he does have pretty good movement on the feet, but he has zero leg kick defense. In every fight, you see him do this. We've, we've, we've all been like, dude, he just keeps getting kicked in the leg. And it hasn't been to his detriment yet. But, like, the dude just keeps getting kicked in the leg. Maybe he's fixed it before this fight, but I don't think so. On the other side, the problem is he's going against Rogerio de Lima, who is a fast starter with a powerful with powerful striking and a freaking nasty leg kick. If the dude comes across the cage, starts throwing big shots, eating a couple of jabs, and says, I'm just going to start hammering that leg, and starts tearing up the leg of Acosta, I think he's going to be able to tear up that leg a lot more than any of the other guys that Waldo Cortez Acosta has been able to do. These guys... This is the, the, the matchup of guys whose names can't fit on those standardized testing sheets when you got to fill in the boxes, one letter per name. Both of these guys never got to put their whole name in the boxes. I guarantee it. When they're growing up, no chance. Uh, but anyway, if the striking's not working, Dewey's got pretty good takedowns. 
He's got decent jujitsu, and if he gets on top of you, the pressure is pretty good, especially because he's going to be like the bigger guy out of the two. I know Waldo Cortez Acosta is taller, but Ruggiero is just kind of a heavier dude, um, and I'm pretty sure Cortez Acosta was previously a light heavyweight. So when you when you got a guy like, you know, Ruggiero de Lima on top of you with that pressure, it's going to be a problem for him. He's also durable, so knocking him out is going to be tough, but his cardio phase hard after about a round, round and a half. Uh, part of me likes the over, uh, cause I think it's at one and a half, I, I, unless I'm wrong, but I think it's at one and a half and part of me likes the over for this reason, the movement and this, the cardio, if he's chasing Cortez Acosta for a while, he's going to probably wear him out a little bit and start working that jab and just kind of dancing around doing the salsa or whatever the heck he does. And maybe survive for about a round and a half. But golly, would I be sweating that every time this big lumbering giant comes in and starts swinging a big-ass leg kick and hit that leg of Cortez Acosta. So I do worry about the over, and I have not played it yet. Uh, if it does hit the over, though, then I got to lean on the Cortez Acosta side to get the win. And I know he's a big underdog. So I'm leaning on, I'm going to say Cortez Acosta gets it done just by decision. And I think he's just going to work the jab and stay at really long range, eat a crap load of leg kicks, and... Probably not fix the problem, but somehow just make it through. You know what I mean? I don't know. I have zero confidence in this pick. Please don't take what I said and then be like, yeah, he's the underdog. Let's hammer that line. Because I, I don't trust it. I Let me know if you guys like the over. I, the heavyweight fights on this card, I just I just don't know. I don't know. But let me know what you guys think. I'll see you Here we next go. Week. Juicy J fight night. If you haven't noticed, if you haven't seen my video taking, talking about my five favorite fighters in the UFC... Juicy J is my favorite fighter in the UFC. This dude gets me excited for every card he's on because he's going to go out there. He's going to fight for your money. He's going to try to rip dudes apart. He's never in a boring fight. Even when he sadly lost in his last one to get knocked out by Alex Caceres with a very good head kick, mind you. Dude, Julian Arosa is my favorite fighter. So take what I'm saying here with a grain of salt, folks, because... My guy, Julian Arosa, is already going to be the pick. But I'm going to break this down. I'm going to do my best to cover the the uh, you know the pros of a guy like Padilla. But Julian Arosa is going to be the pick because I'm never going to pick against this guy. I don't care who he's fighting. He can fight Volkanovski, and I'll be like, Julian Arosa all day. Take my money. I know that's a horrible bet. I probably wouldn't bet it, but I'd pick him. Anyway, in this fight here, we have Fernando Padilla coming in 4-1 in his last five, taking on Julian Arosa 3-2 and in his last five. For Padilla, he's a fast starter. He has good Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he's dangerous off of his back. The problem is he gets taken down really easy to try to work those takedowns. Cool, but he's losing rounds, and he lacks the ability to take fights to the mat to use that Brazilian jiu-jitsu from the top position because his takedowns just aren't there. Uh, it does have decent striking, though. The volume is going to be his best bet, and he does counter-strike pretty well. But he's fighting a guy who's an absolute dog in Julian Arosa. Dude's going to come forward with great pressure. Dude's got cardio for days. Good striking, power, volume. Sometimes he does leave his hands a little bit low, but it's because those punches are coming from all angles. The dude's got good grappling. He's got them choking arms. So if you do try to shoot in on him, like Padilla may do, he's going to get snatched up in a darts or something like that and put to sleep. Julian Arosa is absolutely the pick. Let me know what you have. And if you're picking Padilla, I don't want to hear about it. Let's see you in the next in video. Middleweight division. And if you're still hanging around here, hey, why don't you do me a favor and give that like button a little kiss for me? I appreciate it very much. And if you're enjoying my content and you'd like to see more from me, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I'm trying so hard to reach that ever elusive thousand subscriber mark. I've been doing this thing for about eight months now. We're getting there. We're almost there. We've done this as a team, you guys and me. I'm the one doing the videos. You guys are on, on board. You're commenting. You're liking. You're telling all your friends that you like it. You're subscribing to the video. And some of you are over on Patreon supporting me there. We're trying to get to that thousand, guys. So let's get this done. If you haven't subscribed and you've been on the fence, you're like, man, I just don't know if I want another thing in my subscriptions. Hey, do me the favor. Let's get there, all right? I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and break down this fight right now. We've got... Cody Brundage taking on Hadolfo Vieira. Both of them middleweights. Both of them three and two in their last five. And they have a very similar record. Uh, one more loss on the Brundage side. Otherwise, their record's the same. Uh, for this one here, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because the this, styles do make fights. You hear everybody say it. It's the gosh darn truth. This is an interesting one. Let's we'll start with the Vieira side. He has a very high level of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, beat... So many people in the jiu-jitsu world, uh, you know, championships and what have you, all sorts of things. 
but he's got a massive toolbox that he's carried over with him in MMA and a lot of it is applicable. But the rear naked choke in particular is his specialty. If he gets on your back, you are in for a world of trouble. Um, and he'll add the ground and pound in. He's not afraid. A lot of those pure jujitsu guys are kind of afraid to add ground and pound. Vieira is not. And I do like that about him quite a bit. His jujitsu is a big path to victory for him in most fights. He has decent takedowns as well, but the problem is he does need the fight on the mat to win. If this stays in a striking matchup, it's probably not going to go well for him because his striking, it's average. He does have a good jab, but everything else is just kind of like, uh, probably not good. Not It's not UFC level. The rest of it's not. The jab looks nice. Um, he has had cardio issues in the past, particularly in the, uh, the, uh, the Anthony Hernandez fight, but I mean, he's a big muscled up dude and that those muscles use a lot of oxygen. So you know what happens sometimes? Your cardio starts to fade. So Vieira has had cardio issues. I just don't think it's going to be an issue in this fight because I don't think this fight goes that far. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spill the beans. I think this fight ends in the first round one way or another. On the Brundage side, dude's got solid wrestling with good takedowns. But the problem is I don't think he wants to take down Vieira. But if he does, he has the ability to do so. Powerful striking, but his, take, or his striking defense is terrible. Um, so he's going to throw some big bombs, and if he hits you, he's putting you down, but he just kind of just gets hit as well. Good good chin on him, though. I should have wrote that up there. He has a good chin, but he's a fast starter, and he's going to come across the cage and kind of get this thing going. He's not going to dilly-dally and pitter-patter. He's going to go out across and make this thing happen. Uh, the problem is he tends to look really bad until he doesn't. So, like, he'll be getting hit in the face a lot. That's the lack of striking defense and just not doing anything until all of a sudden he's like, yeah, I should probably shoot a takedown and use some use some of my wrestling abilities because that's a smart idea. Or, hey, I'm just going to land this big, heavy shot and put this person to sleep. So he doesn't usually look very good until he does, and he looks really bad until then. You know what I mean? You probably know. Let me know in the comments if you know what I mean. But in this matchup here, I think I think ends in the first round. Either person who ends in the first round is probably an okay play for a small, like, you know, lunch money bet. You know what I mean? Uh, I like that. Uh, the under's probably all right too, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take Vieira in the matchup. I do think he's the better fighter overall. I think he has more pass to victory, and I think some of the strengths that Brundage have play into the strengths of Vieira. So those takedowns, yeah, Vieira wants this to the mat. Sure, if he's on bottom, he's gonna have to work a little bit harder. But the dude is so good at jujitsu. I don't think that the the wrestling of Brundage is gonna be able to match up to it. Now, although he's a very good wrestler. He's a very, very good Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, and I think he's going to be able to use that. So on the feet, if he can't get the takedown, though, if Vieira can't get this fight to the mat, it's going to look ugly, and Brundage will probably knock him out. So there's what I'm thinking. Let me know what you think, and I'll Wait see you in the time. In the middleweight division, we have Mikhail Oleksiejczuk taking on Kaio Bahayo. Uh For Bahayo, he's 5-0 and in his last five. For Oleksiejczuk, he is 4-1 and in his last five. Let me know how I did on those names. I think I did all right on this one. Uh, for Alex Ayshuk, he is a solid striker with a ton of power, lightning fast hands, and he's going to rip the body pretty well. So I do love the strike hand of Alex Ayshuk. We saw him in his last couple of fights, land some heavy shots, drop people. Uh, yeah, striking, best path to victory. Takedown defense, though, it sucks. It's not very good at all, but he can sweep okay. The problem is, if he sweeps and he's going to try and get back to his feet, or, you know, if he sweeps and tries to stay on top, there's the risk of going against a guy like Bahayo that the jiu-jitsu is going to be there. You run into that. If he tries to get back to his feet, a lot of times he will, but he's going to give up his back, and that's also not good against a guy like Bohio. Now, on the feet, Bohio's not going to do too well. Sure, he has good range control. He has decent striking, but it's a clear mismatch here, and Oleg Seishuk is way better on the feet and probably going to wreck a poor guy like Bohio. However, Bohio's smart enough to know that, and he's probably going to go for the clear, obvious weakness of Oleg Seishuk. Let's Let's do this. Okay, let's go here. Let's go right there. We see that there. And then something else that we're going to see is the gap there. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if Bahio uses that wrestling, he has the good takedowns and that very, very good control. When he gets on top of you, he's not usually letting guys back up. So for Bahio, I think if he can get on top of a guy like Alex Seishuk, I think it's going to be over. I don't think those sweeps are going to happen. Maybe he lets him start trying to get back up so he can take the back because he is a back taker, as I've mentioned there. Um, and I can see Bahio either getting the submission on the ground because he's just going to be that much better or just riding out a crap ton of control time over three rounds. I think Bohio has more pass to victory here. Um, I think there's a lot more time spent on the mat. And I think if Alexei Shuk does not get the knockout, I don't think he wins. So I'm going to take Kyle Bohio here. I feel pretty good about it, but I am a, I'm, I am wary of the knockout power of Alexei Shuk. 
this isn't really a play. It could be a play both sides opportunity, but I don't think so. I think it's just, I mean, if, if you're, I mean, realistically, Alexei Shook by knockout, you probably get pretty good odds on that. I don't know. I think he's better off just playing Bahio. I think he's probably going to get this one done. If he's dumb enough to stand on the feet and just try to trade with him, it's probably not going to go well for him. But let me know what you guys think. I'll see you over in the main event. It's going to be a blast. Thanks. If you've Get ever you thought that I didn't care about you, well, now is your proof that I do. I was originally going to use the video I already recorded for last week's co-main event to break down Ricky Simone and Yadong Song, or Song Yadong, I believe is how you're supposed to say that. If like, you felt those. But I didn't. Why? Well, because I appreciate your support of me and you already liking this video. So I don't have to remind you again, but just in case there's that reminder, I appreciate that. And so I'm going to make this video uh, fresh with the new five rounds rather than you have to be like, oh, yeah, you said co-main event when you whatever. We're starting over. We're going to cover it with the new information. The pick's still the same, but I feel a little better about it now, believe it or not. So here we are. We've got Song Yudong taking on Ricky Simone in the Bantamweight division. Now, for 3-2 and two on, the, on the Song side, is against a very high-level competition. 5-0 and oh on the Simone side. He's beat some good competition, don't get me wrong, but he's not fighting some of the top, top guys like Song has been. Um, although he does have a win over Marab way back in the day, so take that for what you will. Uh, not very many people are beating Marab Devashvili. Ricky Simone did, so keep, keep that in mind. Now, in this matchup here... It's very interesting for me because it's kind of a, a tale of two sides. You know what I mean? You got the striker and the grappler. Yes. Um, you got the, the guy who's been at the top for a bit and the guy who's just on a surge trying to make his way there. Although, Ricky Simone's been around a lot longer, but Yudong Song or Song Yudong has just been able to get into those places. So, it's an interesting matchup, okay? It's our main event for a reason. I'm super hyped for this. I loved this matchup last week, but I, I kept thinking in my head, like, man, I wish this was a five-round fight. And guess what? Now it is. So in this one, let's start with the Song side. Now for Song, or for Yudong, I'll say Yudong side. We're going to start with the Yudong side, is how you say it. He is a solid striker with volume, movement, power, works the body. He can work in combinations. All these things are great, but his striking defense leaves a little bit to be desired. He does get hit quite a bit. Um, but he's very good offensively in the striking department. And that movement is key. Now, his takedown defense is not bad. Don't get me wrong. But he's going against a guy like Ricky Simone. And that's that's a that's really tough because his takedowns are solid. So not terrible takedown defense. Bad against a guy like this. But and he can be held down. We've seen it before. So if Ricky Simone can get on top of, of Yudong, then then uh yeah, that's not gonna go well for him. But, on the other hand, if Ricky Simone, who is a powerful striker in his own right, decides to try to strike with Yudong, I don't think he's going to have good luck there. Because, yeah, sure, the threat of the takedown is going to open up his strikes. And he does have decent striking defense. Yeah, everybody points out the Uriah Faber knockout, whatever. Yeah, he got knocked out by Uriah Faber. It was forever ago. And fighters learn, believe it or not. Us fighters, former fighter in my, you know, in my stance. But fighters, we learn things after we... we have them done to us, okay? Um, great example of this. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a story real quick. So back in the day, uh, first time I ever caught my coach with something in sparring, I hit him and I got excited. I was like, I landed flush on him. So he starts fading back. Now he's te about to teach me a lesson. He starts fading back like this, like, ooh, like like I caught him and gave him a little, little zinger. Nothing hard. I wasn't throwing hard, but he was like fading back a little bit. Like I, you know, got him in a good spot. And much to my dismay, did I learn that that was a stupid idea and to make sure I actually hurt him before I rush in on him next time because he hit me with this spinning back kick, which I can't do in here because there's no room, that was lightning fast, lifted me straight off the ground and broke my ribs right there on the spot. He didn't mean to break my ribs, but I ran right into the kick because I was going forward because uh, I, I hurt him, right? So fighters learn because after that, guess what I didn't do? Rush in like an idiot if, if the first time I crack somebody. I made sure they were hurt first. And a lot of times people get like, oh, man, he cracked him. Why hasn't he chased him down? Well, because they learned that same lesson as I did. And sometimes you got to give it a second to make sure they're actually hurt before you go in. Because otherwise you end up with broken ribs and that sucks. I don't know if you've ever had broken ribs. Let me know in the comments if you have and how bad it sucks. It sucked. But the point is you learn from that. And his striking defense has gotten better since then. That is my point. But... Yudong is the much better striker than Simone. All that to say that. However, Simone's going to come forward with pressure, and he's going to use his wrestling with a ton of takedowns. The volume is going to be there, and he has so many options. That toolbox is huge 
for his takedowns. He can do it from just about any style of takedown. You can imagine I could list them all off, but it doesn't matter. You know what they are. He can do all of them. When he gets you on the mat, he can control you very well. He's going to throw heavy ass ground and pound. He's going to look for that submission. If he doesn't get it, he's going to throw heavy ground and pound again. Then he's going to go right into the submission. If he doesn't get it, he's going to go back to the heavy ground and pound. Because he's not one of these guys that sits there and just tries to fish for a sub for a whole round and not get it. He's not one of these guys that's going to sit there and just throw these little stupid hammer fists. It'll, you know, look kind of weird. Uh, hoping that the ref comes in and stops it. He's going to look for the ground and pound, look for this, go back and forth. He's going to try and inflict damage because if the ref doesn't stop it and you're just doing these dinky little hammers like that, you're not getting much done. And then the next round, the guy's going to come out and he's not going to be beat up. Simone's looking to cause damage on the ground. Yes, yeah, sometimes you go with the quick little punches or whatever to if, you, if you're pretty sure you can get him out of there. But he's looking for the damage. He's looking for the submissions. And the thing is, he has fantastic cardio. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, he hasn't done five rounds. Who knows? Dude's got fantastic cardio. Dude can go three rounds and look like he can then go run a marathon. He's got fantastic cardio. So there's a lot of upside on the, the Ricky Simone side. There's also a lot of upside on the, on the Dong side. But the thing that has me picking Ricky Simone is over five rounds, I, as short of a knockout, which is a possibility, he has been knocked out before, Simone has, I think that, that uh, Yudong is going to have a very hard time stuffing takedowns for three out of five rounds. He needs to get three out of five rounds on the feet because he's not winning this matchup with Simone on the ground. I don't see him getting stuffing the takedowns for three whole rounds out of five. Ricky Simone's going to be able to get this fight to the mat. The dude is relentless with those takedowns, and I think he's going to get them. So Ricky Simone is definitely the pick, and I feel pretty good about it. I know a lot of people are on the Yudong side, and I understand he's a tough kid, young, learning. He has good... He has really good wrestling in his training camp. I believe he's at. Uh, I believe he's actually training with uh, Uriah Faber. Am I wrong? Uh, I believe he's training with Uriah Faber. But either way, he has good wrestling in his camp. But the thing is, Ricky Simone is a legit wrestler, and I think he's gonna be able to get the takedown. So that's where I'm at. I think he's gonna win it probably by decision over five rounds. Let me know what you guys think. Again, I appreciate the heck out of you checking out the video. And if you're still watching, click on whatever the heck's gonna pop up. I don't know what it might be, but subscribe. All that stuff. I love you. Talk to you soon. Thanks.